Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome. So it's Wednesday and we're into our, uh, what I'm calling Jesus in the Old Testament series. And basically what that is talking about is the fact that uh, Jesus quoted the Old Testament quite often. And I want to kind of point to some places uh, that he did and kind of show you how important uh, to Jesus the Old Testament was. So it's, it should be important to us too. So today we're actually on the Sermon on the Mount. And he quoted uh, oh, about six times uh, during that, mostly in chapter five. And so I wanted to kind of show you that, uh, uh, that, and that's what we're gonna look at today. And so, I need these glasses. So basically, and today in chapters five through seven, the three chapters, Jesus lays out a uh, quite a sermon of who he was and to bring the kingdom to the Jewish nation. In chapter five, Jesus tells us we are to look to the Old Testament law and even expand on what G Moses said. I'll just read through this part and let's look at the six quotes from the Old Testament he found important to expand upon. So let's pray. Oh dear Heavenly Father, thank you Lord so much for this opportunity to look into your word. And Lord, how important it is the words you spoke while you were here. So important that we pay attention to those. But it also includes those of the Old Testament also. And I want to thank you and praise you for this uh, time we get to spend in your word. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so. so basically, I'm uh, going to read through Matthew 5, 17 through 48. That's the area that we're talking about. And then just expand upon the six verses that he mentioned uh, that have quote, direct quotes from the Old Testament. There's, uh, there's uh, allusions also, which we may get into at some point. So let's read through it first, and then we'll take a look at those six. Now, the verse is up here. Okay, starting in verse 17. Think not that I have come to destroy the law of the prophets. I have come to destroy. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. But verily I say unto you that he till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. I might mention too that uh, for those that have never heard that term before, a jot and a tittle is, is similar to us saying things, dot every I or cross every T. So Jesus is basically saying here that not one single thing from the law will, be, will not be fulfilled before, uh, uh, until uh, he comes. That was heaven and earth will not pass until one one jot, or you could say one uh, dot, dotted I or one cross T will pass from the law until it be fulfilled. I just want to uh, mention something about this verse first before we go on. It's meaning, it's basically meaning for, uh, that Jesus alone fulfilled over 300 prophecies spoken about him in the Old Testament. Some of the Old Testament prophecies, uh, he's actually fulfilled. We may do a study on these, but these are some of the prophecies he fulfilled. Uh, these ain't quotes. But I'm just going to run through the list, and uh, and so you can get an idea of what we're talking about here. And there's still many more in the future. He was to be born of David's family, and that's in, uh, there's like I don't think I would mention all the verses, but Second uh, Samuel, Psalms 89, uh, Isaiah 9, and the next one is he would be born of a virgin. That's in Genesis 3 and Isaiah 7. He'd be born in Bethlehem. That's in Micah 5. He will sojourn in Egypt. That's in Hosea 11. He will live in Galilee. That's in Isaiah 9. And also he'll live in Nazareth, which is Isaiah 11. He'll be announced by Elijah-like person. And that would be John the Baptist is talking about. And that's prophesied in Isaiah 40 and Malachi 3. Would occasionally... Uh, would occasion the massacre that we, we we read about in Genesis 35 and also Jeremiah 31. He would proclaim a jubilee to the world, that's in Isaiah 58 and also 61. His mission would include the Gentiles. This is mentioned in Isaiah 42. A ministry will be one of healing in Isaiah 53. He would teach through parables, that's in Isaiah 6 and Psalm 78. He would be 
he believed, uh, he would be disbelieved and rejected. That's in Psalm 69, 118, Isaiah 6, and 29. And also by rulers by in Psalm 53. That one we already did recently. Would make the triumphal entry. And, and uh, we see uh, the entry. Uh, that was prophesied in Zechariah 9 and Psalm 118. Was betrayed by a friend for 30, 30 pieces of silver. That's when it was in Zechariah 11, Psalm 41. Would be like a smitten shepherd. That's in Zechariah 13. Would be given vinegar and gall. That's in Psalm 69. They would cast lots for his garments. Psalm 22. His side would be pierced. That's in Zechariah 12 and Psalm 22. Now the bone would be broken. Exodus 12, Numbers 9, and Psalm 34. Would die among malefactors. That's in Isaiah 53. His dying words foretold in Psalm 22. Now we already looked at that one earlier. <laughs> Would be buried by a rich man. That's in Isaiah 53. Raised from the dead on the third day. That's in Genesis 22. Jonah 1. And Hosea 6. And resurrected from. Followed by destruction in Daniel 9, 11, and 12. So maybe at some point we'll take that and study all these also. Plus so many more not yet fulfilled of the tribulation and future kingdom. Uh, so that uh, let me continue in reading uh, through here. I just want to make a point of, uh, of that uh, jot and tittle. So continuing verse 19 of Matthew 5. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, he shall be given, he shall, the same shall be given, be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, that you should not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the, of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and, and there rememberest that thy brother had, hath aught against thee, leave there, there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly, while thou art in the way with him. At least at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, may be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, that thou shalt be no means come out thence, till thou hast paid the utmost farthing. <clears throat> you have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman in, to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her, in her already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members shall perish, and not that the whole body shall be cast into hell. And if the right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of your members should perish, and not that the whole body shall be cast into hell. It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let her give him her a writing of divorcement. <clears throat> But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. Again, you have heard that I, it has been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thy oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool. Neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shall thou swear by thy head, because they cannot make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, and nay, nay. For whosoever is more than these cometh of evil. You have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, or a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto thee, you, that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law, take away thy coat, let him have the cloak also. 
And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. And give to him that askest thee, and from him that would borrow from the, of thee, turn not thou away. You have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. <clears throat> but I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that hate, curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for it maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. But if you love them which love you, who, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Okay, so that's that's the basic uh, area that we're going to be uh, looking at. Uh, six verses here that J Jesus actually quoted from the Old Testament. I'll kind of expand on those a little bit. So the first one <clears throat> is actually in uh, verse 22. And I forgot to uh, let me add it back in here so I can show it first. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever will say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thy fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. But, uh, I had to look it up because I didn't know what Raka is. That's a word I'm not familiar with. So it's an Aramaic uh, translated into Greek. Okay, raka. It means empty, senseless, empty-headed man. It's a term of reproach used among the Jews in the time of Christ. It's, a, it's considered a noun, a term of reproach derived from the Chaldean, reka, worthless, denotes a certain looseness of life and manners, while fool, in the same passage, which we also have in there, means a downright wicked and reprobate person. You'll notice that the ones he addresses here are uh, what are the personal commandments between mankind and others? So the ones between God and mankind, which are the first ones, uh, are actually uh, before these. And we see those in Exodus 20, 3, 3 and 4. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. And also jump into 7 and 8. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless to take his name in vain. We're actually going to look at that one. And remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And it's interesting that Jesus doesn't really mention that one at all. You go to verse 12. And honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the earth land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now these are the ones that are actually uh, what they would call the beginning part of the uh, of the commandments, and they're between man and God. It's what basically those are reference to. The ones we're going to look at are actually between brother between brothers between men and men. So this one I just mentioned the. Uh, uh, In Matthew twenty five twenty two, let me read that again. I forget what I said. <laughs> but I say unto you, whoso is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And so shall say to his brother, Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whoso shall say that a fool should be in danger of hellfire. And for some reason, I think I missed a verse here somewhere. <clears throat> yeah. 
Give me one second. I got to look at something. I know what I did wrong. Okay. Matthew 5, 21 and 22. It's actually at 21. And I'm going to Exodus 20, 13. Somehow I didn't get those verses in there. Okay, let me reread those. So, you have heard that it was said of them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. Whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. Whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. So we're talking about the one from Exodus. So he's quoting Exodus 20, verse 3. Thou shall have no other. No, not that one. Thou shall not kill. So we see here Jesus made it even broader. Uh, that uh, uh, because of hate, hate in our hearts can make us guilty of it also. That is what I see as the thing that separates our sinful nature and our and our reborn soul. The longer I put my trust in the Lord, the easier it is to see things God's way. Not it not as easy. So basically what I'm trying to say here is that the original commandment was thou shalt not kill and Jesus expanded upon that that if we have evil thoughts in our hearts of a brother uh without without a cause uh that uh that's that's like committing this particular commandment. That's what I remember by Jesus was expanding upon it. And it's also, and as I guess said, uh, this is really talking about our sinful nature. It's hard not to uh, have a problem with people that hurt children, for instance, or that uh, commit murder, particularly if it's somebody we know. Uh, it's hard to not to love them uh, as a, but uh, that's that's what I was trying to basically say is that the closer we get to being like God, the easier it is for us to see how God sees things. And I think this is one of those cases is that, uh, is that even thoughts of our own mind of a, of a, a hatred for a brother is just as bad as uh, killing someone. Okay, the next one that Jesus quotes is uh, in Matthew 5, 27. Seems like my verse has got a little out of order here for some reason. Which I'm actually going to start a little earlier. It's, it's in 527, but I'm going to start at 525. Oh, no, that's not. That's 527. Okay, Matthew 527 and 28. And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Oh, wait, I, no. Wrong place. Okay, I'm in the right place. Sorry about that. I think my verses got a little out of order. I was actually going to discuss the Sabbath too before this, but it's not really part of this lesson, so I, was, I skipped it. Okay, next one. Matthew 5, 27 and 28. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And the actual verse that he's quoting there is Exodus 20, verse 14. Thou shalt not commit adultery. So reminded here of the time Jesus dealt with this in John 8, 4 through 11. I mean, I'm going to read that through that. This is the case where a, a woman caught in adultery was brought in front of Jesus. So we're going to pick up John 8, verses 4, and read through verse 11. 
Then said unto him, Master, this woman was t uh, taken in adultery in the very act. You notice they said written the very act, but they didn't bring the man along too, by the way, which was also against Jewish law. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such shall be stoned, but what sayest thou? They're trying to trick Jesus. This, this they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stuck, stooped down with his finger, wrote on the ground, as though he had heard them not. Verse 7. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast first cast a stone at her. Because that was also in the law. That was required that the, the, the one that accused had to be the first one to actually cast a stone. <clears throat> Verse 8, and again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. <laughs> Nobody knows what he was writing. Uh, it's nowhere in the Bible. Plenty of speculation on that one, though. I think he was, uh, if you remember the, in Moses when he was up on uh, Mount Sinai, I believe that was Jesus. And he was he wrote the Ten Commandments with his finger, the finger of God. I remember in the stone tablets. I think that's, that basically he is showing them that when he was writing on the ground. He might have been writing out the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> Or he could have been writing out uh, what sins they had committed. Okay, John 8, verse 9. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are thy accusers? Hath no man to condemn thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I con con condemn thee. Go and sin no more. That last phrase, though, I think is important. Now, don't, don't take that out of the equation. I think that we should strive not to sin uh, under our best abilities. Uh, we're going to fail, uh, but and, that, and that's when we need to repent. But even Jesus here said that uh, uh, the, the goal is to not sin no more. <laughs> So that that uh, so I'm reminded here, uh, I see here that repentance is the key, but also to try and separate ourselves from the temptation. That's the other area. I always love a, a little a cute little riddle I used to hear. Uh, I heard once in a while. Mom walked into the kitchen. Johnny was standing next to the cookie jar, and uh, and 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 Mom says to Johnny, Johnny, what are you doing? And she and he goes, resisting temptation. Well, the place you're not gonna you're gonna resist temptation from the cookies is not standing next to the cookie jar. In other words, get you, get as far away from the cookie jar as possible. And I know in our day and age, it's sometimes hard to get away from the sin. Okay, the next one is Matthew thirty uh, five thirty one and thirty two. He hath been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Okay, so the corresponding verse is actually in Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 5, which I find fascinating because it's got, it goes into a little bit more explanation. When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it came to pass when, that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanliness in her, and let her write her a bill of divorcement, and give it in her hand, and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. And if the latter husband hate her, and write her a bill of divorcement, and give it to her hand, and send her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife. After that, she is defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord. And thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. When a man hath taken a new wife, he should not go out to war, neither go to be charged on any business. But he shall be free at home for one year, and shall cheer up his wife, which he hath taken. I find that last verse kind of interesting. That's where the... Uh, the the long uh, honeymoons actually came into play, I think. The idea being is the man was supposed to have enough savings to be able to take a year off from whatever whatever he did for a living and, and spend it with his wife. But anyways, I find this one an interesting addition to what Jesus said. 
particularly also when it comes to an unbelieving spouse. Paul actually addresses this in 1 Corinthians 7, 10 through 15. And unto the married I command ye not, but uh, not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away with his wife. So they never agreed, uh, Jesus never agreed to divorce. But to the rest I speak, I not the Lord. This is advice from Paul himself. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her, let her not leave him. <clears throat> For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. <clears throat> but if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. So I just found out an interesting uh, side note on there, what Paul added in there, uh, that uh, to, try to, to try to work it out with, uh, even if, and I can see this as a great example, is when one, uh, one spouse uh, receives the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal savior before the other, but hopefully through the influence that the other will get saved. I know that happened in my parents' case. My father was saved first, but it was only a very short time after that. My mother was too. Uh, but, if, but if one of them stays un, uh, unbelieving and, and they want to stay with them, that uh, it helps to, say that, to bring the Christian uh, process into the home either way, and maybe, and maybe things will change in the future. I try to see why Jesus mentioned these during uh, his ministry to see what he was thinking uh, at the time. That's what I'm trying to shoot at here. Okay. Okay, so Matthew 5.33 is the next one. Again, you have heard that it has been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. Now, this is an important one, I think, that uh, when it comes to taking an oath, we actually see this in four different places in the Old Testament. Exodus 20, verse 7, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. And I think that applies here. That, that it's, it's not a, it, it includes swearing, but it's not only about swearing, it's about representing God. That you got to do it faithfully and don't do it in vain. Also, Leviticus 19.12. Ye shall not swear by my name falsely, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. Numbers 30, verse 2. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall be, do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. So, if, so even if God didn't tell you to do it, if you decide to do it on your own, then you should keep to your word. Also Deuteronomy 23, 21. When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay it, for the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee, and it will be a sin if in thee. So this one I feel is more about finishing what you started. And like when we make a New Year's resolution and, and, and somehow after a couple of months we were not able to keep it, God expects us to keep our vows. Uh, particularly to him. But I also believe that if it's done with a, a pure heart, it will bring you joy also. I have found that I really look forward to uh, these daily devotionals I do here on uh, studying the Bible. It actually started out kind of interesting. Uh, my uh, last pastor uh, actually had uh, asked me to help him. He was doing devotionals during the, uh, during the uh, period of the, uh, the lockdowns where uh, the plague and, and so to keep, uh, to keep the spirits up while people were at home, he would do these morning devotionals each morning. And I was videotaping them for him and putting them up online. But when he passed away, just before he passed away, he asked me to do a couple. And uh, I said, sure. And when I did them, uh, the people kind of still enjoyed them. So I kept doing them. And that was a couple of years ago now, and I still keep doing them. <laughs> 
So I don't know if it was a calling by God or not, but I sure do enjoy doing them. So uh, I'll keep going. So the next one is Matthew 5.38. You have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. I'm going to add a few verses to this one. But I say unto you that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have the cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that askest thee, and from him that uh, would borrow thee, turn, thou, turn not thou away. Okay, so the corresponding verse is in uh, Exodus 21, 24, and 25. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, hand for a hand, foot for foot. Burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. This one could be a tough one. I kind of see this in, in relation to what God has put in front of us. When it comes to the Great Commission, and no matter what... Uh, and no matter what, accept the persecution and not be concerned even unto death. All of the apostles faced many trials for the sake of the gospel. Uh, we should also not use persecution as a reason to stop doing what God has given us to do. Looking to the examples we see in the Bible, I'm reminded uh, of a few passages. And one of notice was a man by the name of Polycarp. I actually have a, uh, a possible rendition of him. I don't know if it's... It's from a painting or something that somebody did. Oh. This is actually an interesting one. Polycarp was actually the uh, uh, a disciple of John. John the ba uh, John, the dis Apostle John, lived until uh, in the late 90s, uh, ni somewhere between 95 and 100 AD. And his his first disciple, one of his disciples, was Polycarp. He's quite famous because he's actually, uh, most people believe, mentioned in Revelation by Jesus Christ. Uh, he was actually in Smyrna, uh, and he, he carried on the ministry of John and was quite uh, influential. Uh, and at, during that time frame, the, uh, the, uh, the Roman emperor required people to worship him. He, could, he had declared himself to be God and demanded worship, and Polycarp refused to. And he actually made a statement about this. He says, 80 and six years have I served Christ, nor has he ever done me any harm. How then can I blaspheme my king who saved me? I bless thee for dining uh, me worthy of this day and this hour that I may be among the martyrs and drink the cup of my Lord Jesus Christ. They're actually going to burn him at the stake. And what's interesting is that they actually were uh, unsuccessful at first. And I, uh, the person tried to burn him, and he wasn't dying. The flames weren't touching him. It's kind of like the situation in Daniel with the three friends. So they actually just run him through with a sword, and he did die. But Jesus actually mentions this in Revelation 2, 8 through 11. And uh, he kept it a little bit vague enough to where maybe the person uh, that Polycarp didn't know. Uh, but uh, either way, it didn't bother him because he continued to do the work that God had assigned him to do. I think that's what this is talking about: is don't don't fear death, uh, and keep up the uh, keep up the work assigned to you, no matter what. So let's read through that. It's in Revelation two, eight through ten. This is Jesus. By the way, when I get done with this series, that's my plan. Is I really want to I want to study the seven churches of Revelation uh, in depth, and so that's my plan uh, after we finish this one on Wednesdays. But it could be a few weeks away yet as long as it takes me to go through these Old Testament ones. But uh, this will be one of the ones. And uh, so I'll read through it here. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of, they, of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of these things which have which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. So I think this is directly talking about Polycarp. Uh, 
and because he was the uh, he was in Smyrna during the same time frame uh, that Jesus is talking about here. This would be in the late hundreds A.D. Uh, Ephesus was the first church. That was the church of John. And then you can see here that Polycarp mentions in this statement. A statement was made just before they lit the fire to burn him to death. They were asking him to denounce Jesus Christ and to, and to worship uh, Caesar. So, okay. Down to the last one. Matthew 5, 43 through 45. You have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. And the corresponding verse to that first one is in Leviticus 19.18. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. I also like the story Jesus told about. Somebody asked him who their neighbor was. And we'll finish with this. It's a great story. I think most people have probably heard it. It's the story of the uh, Good Samaritan. It's in Luke 10, 25 through 37, and we'll finish with this. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So this lawyer is talking to Jesus, trying to trick him. And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Samaritans were hated in this time frame. So if you were a Jew, you hated the Samaritans just with no reason at all. Verse 32. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he had saw him, he had compassion on him. So this is a Samaritan, the ones that supposedly the Jews hated because uh, for no apparent reason, who's going to actually help this man. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these, which now of these three, thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showeth mercy on him, then say Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. So that's a great way to end this. How to be a good neighbor. To, uh, to be there, to be the one that uh, steps out in faith and, uh, and helps a fellow man. And so let's end with that. Dear Heavenly Father, oh Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord. May we all be good Samaritans when, when, when uh, time calls on us. And we can be always there ready to help a brother in need. I thank you, Lord, so much for these sayings of yours uh, that you show us that uh, not only are you the author of the Old Testament, but that you also quoted them often and used them in your teachings. And it's important for us also to realize that uh, uh, the Old Testament uh, uh, helps us to see the New Testament. As I remember Chuck Missley used to say, the Old Testament is, uh, the New Testament is the revealed revealing of the Old Testament, and the Old Testament is the, the concealing of the New Testament. And that uh, they need both of them to fully understand you, Lord. And I thank you for that honor to be able to study both. And we have both in our possession. We praise you and thank you so much for all you do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay. So you have a great day. And we will be back in Matthew. Speaking of Matthew, uh, I know we studied this before. So if you want to go back and really dig into this, you can go back to the Matthew 5 study. 
uh, when we were doing the Olivet, uh, doing the uh, the full story of Matthew. We're getting uh, we're, now we're in Matthew. I forget where we're at. Uh, somewhere it's uh, we're leading up to where the night before uh, his crucifixion is where we're at in Matthew right now. So I'll talk to you again tomorrow on that, and have a great evening.